All schools are now required to identify 5-10% to of their pupils as being gifted and talented. These will be the pupils who are the most able or have the potential to be the most able. It's a totally inclusive model and will include children from all walks of life and backgrounds. We truly believe in provision for children. It's about providing the right environment and the right experience which actually allows all children the opportunity to demonstrate their talent and their ability. It's inclusive, it's not something separate. It's about children and young people having challenge in their lessons every single day. If you believe that education is making the most of every child's abilities, then that means that you need to make the most of every child's abilities, including the children who are the most able. In this film, we will see how two inner city primary schools have implemented a gifted and talented programme using the core principles of provision, identification and monitoring. Christchurch Primary is a one-form entry school in East London. Head teacher Judy Hamill is passionate about raising achievement and aspiration by embedding gifted and talented provision. In order to raise achievement, we have to raise expectations. And I think gifted and talented does that because it actually encourages children to develop something they enjoy doing to a high level. If you study chemistry later in school, one of the first reactions you would do would be to mix an acid uh, and an alkali, a base. At Christchurch, they have invited experts like Professor Phillips from Imperial College to give an inspirational science lesson. This is one very inclusive way of providing a stimulating learning environment. I think if you really want to inspire your staff, I think just raising the whole agenda of it um, and actually having meetings where you think about different ways of learning, imaginative ways of developing children and actually in some ways that's what gifted and talented is, it's using all those different learning styles and identifying. Why do you think mine's going faster than yours? Because I mixed it better, because I've done it before and you haven't. <laughs> that's right. Well, now we've got your brains working, let's see if we can move into our first experiment. In lessons, teachers at Christchurch are regularly creating opportunities for gifted and talented pupils to be identified. The big question about identification is that you can't identify children unless you give them an opportunity to show their talents. So any sort of national tests are, if you like, your first line of identification, that's the first thing. That's not enough, so teacher recommendation. Let's look at what the teachers really think. We can look at self-nomination. It's quite interesting to ask children about their own interests. What about peer nomination? It's amazing how much information there is in the classroom about who's good at what. Then there are other sorts of diagnostic things that we can do, like looking at CATS tests, which are cognitive achievement tests, where we can see whether children have spiky profiles or not. Children who are very good at one thing, not very good at another, which might mean that the thing that they're not very good at masks the thing that they are very good at. So do you know what the purpose of the game is? To make a word and to make a creature. They were so stimulated and excited from this morning. It was very interesting because they were finding children who were perhaps in lower ability groups really grasping concepts and becoming very animated and keeping up with what we would consider to be the higher ability groups. There's absolutely no reason why children who don't speak English fluently shouldn't be on the gifted and talented register. We need to be looking for children who've got specific learning difficulties, children who are maybe even on the special needs register. It's a totally inclusive model and we're looking for children from all walks of life, all backgrounds. At Hampton Gurney Primary, staff have been embedding a gifted and talented programme for a number of years. What we're trying to encourage the children to do is think beyond what is on paper, to use their creativity, to use their imagination and to actually apply higher order thinking skills so that they can actually maximise their learning. Teachers have to think around their teaching approach because these children often have learning styles that are very different from the others. OK, yeah, well, we're going to carry on with the work we've been doing so far this week on play scripts. And I'm going to ask you, just for about a minute with your partner, how we would convert just the first few lines of chapter one into a playtext, okay, into scene one. 
Talk to your partners about it. Some of the first things that you need to include. Excuse me. I'm going to go for Robin Hood. I'll be saying that because this is just a nursery. But that would be a. We've had a lot of training in school looking at Bloom's taxonomy. We've had insets in that. And we actually go through the high level thinking questions, and that's part of our regular planning on a weekly basis that you, we would actually refer to that. Are we, are we meeting those gifted and talented children's needs? Right, let's get straight onto the speech. So who's the first person that speaks? You just look at your text. Robin Hood. Robin Hood. And what does he say? That's me. But well, who are you? But who are you? How could he say that? Let's put an adverb in here. How could he say that? Say it like, that's me. That's me, you could, but how, how would he to describe it? We need to have an adverb in there. Alex? Curiously. Could say it curiously, because he is curious. He doesn't know who she is. The best way to meet G&T pupils' needs is to do it in the classroom. Not only because that's good for them, but it also has an effect on the whole rest of the class. We know from research that if we set our expectations and our aspirations higher by looking at the needs of the more able children in the class, we get a slipstream effect where we get improved provision and therefore improved learning for the whole school. You are working on scene one, OK? So you've got two sheets of paper. Good, Rebecca. You've got the Robin Hood story and you've got this in front of you. So I've actually started you off here. Within the class today, they were all working within their own levelled groups, and I differentiated the work, obviously, three ways for three different levels of, of grouping. What did we say was a little bit more challenging about doing scene three, Mark? There's no speech at all. There is no speech at all. So what do you need to do if there is no speech at all? You need to think more to get more speeches. And where are you going to get these ideas of what they say? Because it doesn't tell you, it just describes lots of stuff. Look at them. Things that they sort of say, like yeah. explain whatever, right. and turn it into speech. Good, so you actually need to look through chapter three, Alex, for clues, don't you? I hadn't specifically modelled that work in class. Sometimes if I want to stretch them a lot, I actually on purposely do that. I won't model too much what their task will be so that they've got some kind of understanding, but essentially it's driven themselves and they have to almost motivate themselves to find those answers and search for how they're going to meet the objective. And to Robin and John. Lazily. That was a delicious cake. Well, if it wasn't for you with, with your big hands, we wouldn't have got it in time. But without your great plan, it would have been a disaster. Hip, hip, hooray for Robin and John. Well done. Thank you for that so far. I think it's important that as teachers, we think about our process of teaching. You know, how are we teaching? Are we using the correct questions in order to be able to raise attainment, in order to be able to get children engaged and to stretch them a little bit more? Thinking skills very much builds on the, the breadth and the depth, which is essential with children's learning, particularly the gifts and talented children. Now, I need you to think very hard, because I want you to classify these adult animals <coughs> in a different way. You have to put all the animals that are the same together, but as well the ones that are the same colour. How are you going to do this? Taking kids out of the class, I think, works well because they're working with children that they're the same ability and they can all come up with ideas and talk about them and agree and disagree. A lot of speaking and listening that maybe in a class situation sometimes you cannot do as much just because there's 20 other children around. I think we could like do it like if we put all the adult ducks in one column like this and then you can put all of them like that. Well, maybe we could do the same colours on the side like that. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Yeah. These activities always have some cognitive conflict. They need to think and suddenly something's tricky and they need to really think hard to find a, an answer. OK, are you happy with this? That's a rabbit. I know, but that, this is a red animal. Oh, I know what we can do. We can, like, put... We can put this one in the middle. Now, we and could do something equal. that is called a Venn diagram. As gifted and talented coordinator, Ava is responsible for monitoring and assessing what is being provided for the gifted and talented throughout the whole school. She also regularly re-evaluates who is in the gifted and talented cohort to ensure that it is representative of the school as a whole. One of the interesting things about identification, of course, is that once you've done it once, it's not done and dusted. Actually, children's skills and their talents and their abilities change over time. So we need to keep this whole idea quite fluid. What was difficult today? Did you find something <laughs> difficult today? Um, I found it difficult um, um, for this because I had to think a bit. What if 
An umbrella was made of glass. In the classroom, teachers should try and utilise lots of moments for teaching problem solving and open-ended activities, which allow children to explore and to communicate and to think on a completely different level. It's making the curriculum fun for, for all children. For your luxury, you can see, because it's transparent, you can see through the umbrella. Questioning skills are a core tool that I use under the teachers in the school to help children um, develop their thinking skills and be independent in coming up with the answers for themselves. Storm raining, then the glass will break. Because it is fragile. fragile. Good girl. One of the interesting things about the cohort that has to be identified for the DFES is that there are supposed to be two thirds of the cohort are supposed to be gifted and one third are supposed to be talented. And the gifted children are those who are good at academic subjects, the talented children who are good at art, performing arts, etc. The interesting thing, of course, is that there are a significant number of children who would be in both. You need to look at all sets of abilities, both the academic and the non-academic. You now have one minute to look at what I've put out for you and to draw it, Tambi, without looking down. Halima, not allowed to look down. Are you ready? Go. Don't look down, don't look down. As art coordinator, I'm trying to stretch children's imaginations and abilities. I don't want them to just be able to copy a picture out. I want them to be really thinking and be able to have a bit more freedom and just sort of keep the lesson flowing, keep the drawing, you know, coming. Keep looking, Abid. Really look hard. What can you see? What are the shapes? I think in any school you have teachers who are very skilled in different areas and it's allowing teachers to actually actually be free about that, to actually develop their skills and develop the skills of the children. I want you to just choose one thing, one part of what we can see here and I would like you to try and do what I've just done and try and draw what you can see inside and we call that a negative shape. Even though it was a really difficult concept for them to grasp, I think it was still valuable because I think most children by the end of the lesson they had got something out of it and they had realised what I was talking about and they had got the idea of negative shapes and you could see it on the paper. You can see that she hasn't drawn the ladder. Something shows you that she's been drawing the spaces inside the ladder. Ali. I think obviously subjects like art and science to some extent and maths sort of transcend different languages. So it's, it's looking out for those children, not just the children that actually can speak the most clearly in English. There's a natural cycle that schools go through when they're looking at G&T provision. If they have this general conversation first, so that they get a clear idea of what a definition is of gifted and talented, then that helps them to identify who the gifted and talented children are, and then they start providing for them. But the thing is, the better that they get about providing for them, the better they get at identifying able pupils. So we start getting this positive cycle of identifying able pupils, providing for them, which helps us to identify even more. <laughs>